let me make sure. Yeah. Now okay. you got it. All right. Thank you. Now we are recording. Yeah. Very good. All right. So, well, Rusty, welcome to the Environmental Harmony Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Will you just tell us a little bit about yourself and the Long Island Native Plant Initiative? Absolutely. So um, my name is Rusty Schmidt. I'm the president of the Long Island Native Plant Initiative with uh, a not so great acronym of LIMPI. So we, so I'll say LIMPI the rest of the way through. But um, uh, a little bit about me is that I'm a landscape ecologist. That's what I call myself. Um, I originally uh, have an undergraduate degrees in ecology from the University of Minnesota at Duluth. And then I went back to school for a master's uh, degree in uh, landscape architecture. And uh, so that's, um, so, you know, I, I, that's what I do is I do landscapes for um, ecology, for uh, planting, for natives, for restorations, to really protect the environment. Um, and then I'm also known for uh, rain gardens and, um, and then especially native plantings, uh, especially, and, and so, uh, that's what I've been doing. I moved here to Long Island nine years ago, um, and I've been doing I've been doing that same practice, same kind of work right here on Long Island. Uh, so, for instance, my my background picture is the meadow that we uh, uh, developed for the Sisters of Saint Joseph property in uh, Brentwood. Uh, so here in uh, in New York. Um, that's Beautiful. a little bit about me. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 quite yeah. It doesn't it won't look like this again. This is the first flush of plants with a high volume of black-eyed susans, which is what all that yellow is. Mm -hmm. um, they are a short-lived uh, perennial. They only lasted a couple years, and uh, they will only come back if there's a disturbance. If some you know, <laughs> if we allow bison in there and trample it, or gophers start digging it up, uh, or we you know accidentally did some digging out there. That's um, the great thing about meadow gardens, though, is they're so they're so constantly changing and flowing. Correct, absolutely, absolutely. So, Limpy or Long Island Native Plant Initiative, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, we've been uh, been around for a while, but we're we're run by a whole bunch of volunteers. So, for instance, I am a volunteer and the president of Limpy. Uh, we have a board of eleven members. Um, our 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 goal or, or the reason we're around is to protect the genetic uh, makeup of our native plants here on Long Island and then um, and, and get that material, seed material out to the out to the world in general and especially for uh, properties here on Long Island. Okay, super. How did you begin this initiative or how has the initiative begun? Yeah, yeah. So there is a, the, the um, it started before me coming here to Long Island. So originally it was called the Long Island Grass Initiative and that was started in 2005. Um, it was primarily uh, a brainchild of uh, our executive director, Polly Weigand. And, um, and they really were trying to uh, do restorations and, and were having a hard time getting um, genetic seed from for the right plants, especially the, the, the four core grasses of little blue stem, big blue stem, switchgrass, and Indian grass. And the materials that they were getting for those restorations were actually cultivars, were not even true native species. And so that was when she decided that this that had to change. And so that was the Long Island Grass Initiative for a number of years. And then we formalized and became a nonprofit in 2011. Um, so then uh, how that all kind of started was um, they grew plants uh, in a founder's plot, and I can explain what that is you know, later, uh, to get seed to grow for restorations. And the extra plants they had, uh, they put out for a plant sale. And between the plant sale, grants from Suffolk County, grants from the state, um, um, uh, we did a symposium or an educational um, uh, symposium uh, and all that kind of culminated to get us enough money uh, to uh, uh, become a nonprofit. Uh, there's the rules to become a nonprofit is you have to have a certain amount of money in the bank. 
And so then we then changed our name to Limpy um, uh, because we decided that we shouldn't be just focusing on the grasses. We want to you know, look at all plants. And so it was really a help of um, the Green Belt, which is a uh, nursery in New York City that is run for New York City parks. Um, the plant, there's a couple plant material uh, centers, Cape May and Big Flats that really helped us get started in understanding how to grow plants and what to do. We got, we received help from NRCS, Suffolk County Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, Suffolk County Parks, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, New York State Parks, uh, Nature Conservancy, <laughs> Suffolk Community College gave us a greenhouse that we could start working in originally. Um, and then, but the uh, big one was BP Solar uh, created a solar array at the Brookhaven National Labs and they um, uh, gave us a nice chunk of money to kind of got us get us over the, the threshold to become a nonprofit. And so then that's when we really started as a nonprofit. So that's kind of the crazy beginning of taking a long time to get to where we are now. Wow, it's been a really collaborative bunch of different yes. groups coming together. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I have been the president for four or five years now, I, I forget, but there's been a lot of people before me and I'm hoping a lot of people after me as well that this, this program continues to grow. And we're, um, we're in a really good place right now, uh, both financially, um, logistically, we have our own greenhouse now that we own um, and a whole bunch of things. So we've, we're really moving in the right direction now, I think. So, and I, you know, we can get into that as you, as we go. Yeah. I would love to hear about the work that you're doing right now with Limpy. Yes. So we currently just finished up um, collecting wild seed. So a little bit of our mission and uh, which is kind of helps understand what we're doing. So uh, we are, um, uh, our mission is, is to protect and, and, and secure the genetic makeup of Long Island uh, wild seed or wild plants and, it, and, it's, and, it's, and its seed. And so um, our wild plants and the seed from it is a valuable resource that is slightly endangered because we keep expanding uh, um, building in new areas. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what's really happened is our native plants are becoming more and more isolated further and further apart. Um, and, the, and so because they're getting smaller populations and further away from another population so that they're not able to uh, interact uh, and get pollinated from another source, the genetics um, are becoming uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, it's uh, the, um, uh, the genetic makeup, they're kind of inbreeding, thinking about that way. And so that the, the diversity of the, of the genetics within those plants are becoming a little less. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is we collect seed from um, uh, different populations, which we call in a, a session. And so we have a, a population from Fire Island and another population from East Hampton or South Hold or Northport or Nassau County or, or even Staten Island, when we do that, we've taken all of those, we've taken that wild seed and we really want to have seven different accessions. So seven different isolated populations of plants. And then uh, that half that seed goes into a seed bank for genetic posterity so that we're protecting the, the genetics. And the other half of our seed we grow and um, what we do is we grow it into uh, what we call a founder's plot. So a small area, we plant a thousand uh, plants in this uh, small plot with uh, um, uh, the sim similar number of plants from all seven accessions or all seven isolated populations. And then they, inter, uh, they interpollinate because of, you know, whichever way they're pollinating, wind or, or, or birds or, or uh, butter, bees and butterflies. Uh, primarily bees, um, then the seed from, and because they're cross-pollinating, the seed that comes from those plants are actually um, considered more genetically diverse than what we're finding out in the wild. That's the seed that we're trying to get into the seed uh, production for uh, restorations 
or we're gr growing those plants to get the plants uh, sold and, and out into the landscape. And so that we're getting more diversity mm -hmm. of, of the genetics of our local ecosystem and our local plants. So, and then of course, part of the other mission is then educating that, and hence I'm here, education about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And so kind of pulling all that together. Okay, that's wonderful. And so these plants, because they're so much more resilient to the not, the native area that you're in in Long Island, they've been there for millennia, right? They're right, right. Yeah. And so, for instance, I'm from, I told you I was from Minnesota. We have similar native plants. So, for instance, those four native plants that we talked about at the beginning, little blue stem, big blue stem, in Indian grass and switchgrass. Right. Um, little blue stem is very, all four of them are very common in our grasslands in Minnesota. So, but they are different and uh, they have genetically um, uh, changed slightly to be more appropriate for this, for this area. So the little blue stem that I see in Minnesota looks um, different enough than the little blue stem that is here on Long Island. Here on Long Island, we are, the plants are not quite as robust. They're, uh, they're a little thinner, but they're a heck of a lot more salt tolerant. And so if we take a Minnesota plant and bring it here, it probably survived for a little while, but it won't thrive. And so we really need to use the plants that are, have been adapted to our climate, our soil conditions, weather conditions, sun conditions, thin soils, sandy soils, blah, 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 to be appropriate for this site, for this area. Right. And we were kind of discussing before the interview about um, the same thing with vegetable plants that people are growing in there. Right, right, right. In their backyard plots or whatever, and how we're, we're like importing them from all over the world, and then they don't do as well as if we're saving and um, sharing local, locally adapted right. annual plants. That is correct. And, and there's a number of companies out there creating new breeds of plants that might be um, more, have more production, or the berries are bigger, or whatever. Um, we're finding that they're not as um, uh, conducive to the site that we're having. So for instance, blueberries, native, native shrub here on Long Island, the blueberries of the, the native plants are much smaller than the blueberries that are, that are coming from all the cultivated species. Um, and even though they're both, you know, uh, vacciniums, uh, both native blueberries, the berries themselves are different. They might have similar sugar contents. They might taste similar. They might even taste a little sweeter in the in the other produced ones. But what I have been seeing is that the cultivated species don't seem to be as um, resistant to diseases and or hardy to Long Island because uh, we have some unique conditions here. Um, same with uh, the things that are not native, like tomatoes or cucumbers or things like that. Uh, we really should be protecting that that seed source, and uh, and really using what seems to be appropriate and working well here. One of the companies that I like to use to get vegetable seeds for my own garden is a company called Seed Savers in Iowa, and they have plants. Uh, they and there's other companies like them, but that's the one I I tend to use. Um, there uh, they have. Um, seeds that from heirloom plants, the plants that have come from uh, my gr our grandparents' time. And right. so what I like to do is use those plants, get them started, and then continue to keep that seed for my own uses and continue to grow plants that are uh, successful in my garden uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and are prolific with the vegetables that I want to eat. So, right. Yeah. And seed saving is so simple and fun. I feel like people just don't think they about forget. it often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And seed saving from vegetables is totally different from native plants, um, but it's uh, what we need to do. But yes, that is very, very much, it's, it's kind of a lost art, I think, um, that is not utilized as much as it should be. And then the other piece to that is, um, I think most people don't realize that you really need to have a robust um, native perennial uh, bad in your gardens because you're going to find that you're going to get a lot more bees 
uh, to your garden from those. Right. And those bees are doing all the uh, all the pollinating to get fruit from or veg from your your fruit and vegetable garden. And so it really, uh, you know, I, I've noticed that the more pollinators I put into my garden or um, pollination type plantings of native plants that I put into my garden, the more tomatoes I get, uh, for instance, right. or peppers or whatever you're trying to grow. It's kind of like the principle in permaculture of having really wide borders yeah. around all of your plantings that also distracts your pests and. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, and then you get our native, there's a lot of good plant are good insects, beneficial insects. Most, be, most insects are very beneficial to our gardens and they're uh, uh, taking out or wiping out or, or removing some of those pests that we want to get rid of. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's better to use uh, native plants and, and, um, and uh, beneficial insects over an insecticide or some other treatment for your plants. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you mentioned that it's very different saving seeds from vegetables as it is from uh, the native perennial plants. Can you describe that? Yeah. Um, so uh, the the big thing is, um, our, so first, first I got to put a little qualifier in here. When we go out, we have permits to go out and collect native seeds um, f for all public areas like um, our county parks, our state parks, national parks, we have a permit to collect. And back to at the beginning, I said that this is a um, endangered resource that we need to protect. Uh, we have a, a trained group of folks that we train to go out and ethically collect seed. So we can't, we, we don't wanna over harvest, that could cause problems. We definitely don't want to trample or things like that. We have to really be careful and thoughtful on how we collect the seed that is out there. Um, so that's the first thing. So just because you might be in a park and you see some plant that you know is really cool and you want to put it into your own garden, uh, the first rule of thumb is you need to get permission to collect that seed. And that's true. We have some uh, private properties that we need to go to as well. And so we need to have, um, we get permissions beforehand. So that's the first caveat I wanna say. Now, <laughs> the cool stuff, we collect um, more, no more than 20% of the seed that is uh, available. So, and, and we only collect from populations of plants that have 50 individuals or more. So just because we found um, five, butterfly milkweed in a patch somewhere that we that is out there. It's only five plants. It's not a big enough population to be collecting from. Their genetics are probably not very diverse. They are, uh, and if we're collecting from them, we're not, we, we could potentially wipe out that population from, from the site that they're at. Right. And so, so we, so, uh, so some of our favorite plants that we like to collect from are becoming more and rare, more rare in large enough populations to collect from, and wow. butterfly weed being one of those. Um, and so we need permission, we ethically collect, but then, um, uh, and because we're really trying to protect the resource that's out there that's naturally and wild. Um, and, uh, and then the last point is, we don't ever collect from uh, in listed species, endangered or threatened species. Uh, it seems counterintuitive, but we actually want to leave them right where they are at. Um, we um, we really are trying to protect them, and uh, and one of the plants for inst uh, and some of the plants that are listed are listed because of exploitation. So, for instance, wintergreen is a beautiful beautiful ground cover evergreen plant, and it's pretty um, common around Long Island. But it's it's very easy to exploit it and and over collect from it. But now, okay, so now that we've done that, now we've gotten that seed. Um, uh, most of our native seeds need um, a different kind of treatment than just putting them into a packet and ready to go to, uh, or throwing them into the, uh, throwing them into a, a baggie and saving them for next year. Uh, so what these seeds need to happen is many of them need to be uh, cold stratified, meaning that you've taken the seed, you've cleaned it down to just the seed, you put them into a little baggie of, of sand, uh, soil that they would be normally found in, wet it, damp, uh, dampen it so it's damp, and put it in the refrigerator. And uh, we 
And then what I like to do is open it up and rub that every once in a while. Uh, so you're scarifying the seed, putting it back in the refrigerator, and they tend to need to be in there for 30, 60, or 90 days, depending on the seed. And that replicates what happens in nature. The seed falls in the fall, lands in the ground, has to have good seed to soil contact, get rubbed into the soil, and freeze the cycle, same type of deal, and then it's ready to grow and we're replicating that naturally. So most of our vegetable, all of our vegetable seeds, I don't know of many that need to be cold stratified. Right. Um, they tend to come from the fruit and are able to be reused. So that's one way, and some of our seeds, think about them, um, need to be uh, acidified, meaning it's the same process as if a bird eats it and goes through the system and comes out the other end, that seed is now ready to grow we have to mimic that as well. So some of, especially a lot of our berry plants need to have uh, taken the fruit off, run through an acidic uh, system, and then put into a cold stratification or right into the ground. Uh, so it, it mimics what nature does. Right, that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, most, most people don't think like that. So you gotta think right. of what nature does and we're trying to mimic that as much as we can. I always think it's so fascinating to think about like the first people who realized just it must have just been a lot of observation like okay the birds are eating these seeds they're growing again the ones I'm just planting aren't correct right yeah. right and and there's some plants that we're still trying to figure that out for so for instance um uh sweet fern uh, comptonia perigenia uh, uh beautiful plant found in the edge of the woods commonly found on Long Island seems to be very common on the edge of the Pine Barrens woods or other woods. That seed, we have yet to, we have such a low production value. We've tried a number of different things and we're only getting one, 2% of the seed that we collect turning into plants. So we're still, we're still learning. Right, trial and error. Yeah, right, right. And we're trying with small batches because again, we're not trying to hurt a population because we're only getting one, one 2% success rate. Sure. So when you go into a, an ecosystem where you see that there aren't enough, you know, butterfly bushes to collect seed from, would you then go back to that area and plant more of that seed? Yeah, we no, we haven't done that. It sounds like a good idea, idea again, but we need to make sure that those, um, uh, those plants that we are putting in there are, again, from locally genetic ecosystem. And so what we're finding, and uh, I read this this the other day, or, or heard about this this the other day, a local uh, native plant, um, uh, lupin, uh, wild lupin, um, is uh, it's it's fine. We're finding that the the many of the plants that are out there in the wild are not wild lupin anymore. It's a hybrid that looks very similar to it. It's hard to find the right plants that are already not hybrids. And why that's important is the Carner blue butterfly is um, the lupin is the host plant for that plant. So the Carner blue butterfly only goes on the wild lupin and it doesn't grow on the hybrid version. And so we have an endangered butterfly that's becoming more endangered because the lupin that is out there is becoming more hybridized and not staying as the native true lupin. So we might lose both, unfortunately. Yeah, it's so interesting. That's yeah, just happening all over the planet as we're globalizing and right, right. And so that's the that's our concern that that um, if you go and plant some butterfly weed with that small patch out there, are you really doing the right thing? And uh, we really need to. It, there's a lot of science that you need to think through to make sure that you're actually putting the correct plant, the correct species of plant, and the right genetics there to grow that population. However, that population, if protected, should be expanding on its own. And so we will mark an area, understand where it is, might be a small population, and, and go back every so often just to see if we are now getting to a threshold that we could collect from. Okay. So what's, what's the purpose of the seeds that you are collecting? How are you putting them to use? For restorations and for planting for other homeowners. So, so our uh, we do sell plants, um, and, and all of our plants that we sell in our plant sale 
we try to have one in the spring and we definitely always have one in the fall. Um, you can, you know, check out our website, find out when our next plant sales are going to be. Um, however, you can plant. Uh, <laughs> I'm sitting too still, one second. There go. <laughs> sitting too still, my light turned off. Um, I thought I was moving enough, but obviously not. Um, the, <laughs> be more the, animated. Uh, what was that? So you have to be more animated. Yeah, that's right. I thought I was, but obviously <laughs> not. Um, so the, uh, the uh, now I'm a little embarrassed. That's pretty funny. Um, the, 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 um, uh, what was I saying? What was the um, You're talking about the plant sales you do in the spring and the fall. Oh, right. So that those plant sales, those plants that we're selling are really for homeowners and, and landowners across, uh, Long Island to collect. And they know they're getting not only a native plant, but local eco type native plant. And then the other piece to it is that, um, uh, even though we, uh, we have plant sales at certain times, uh, we will sell plants throughout the season. So you can reach us and find out what we have available throughout the, you know, I'll, like a nursery. The only difference is, is that uh, we, we're not open all the time. We would have to make an arrangement to, to come. We have volunteers and limited staff, so. Okay. What kinds of restoration projects are you involved with? Well, so it's like the one behind me, um, every time we are looking to um, um, put in native plants on a larger scale, we're always looking for the seed to plant out there. And, uh, and, and it's, it's difficult to find proper uh, plants for the area. And that it's really important. Um, what, we, what you shouldn't be doing when you're doing a true uh, project for conservation or restoration is that you really need to make sure that the plants are, that, that you're not using a cultivar. Um, cultivars are usually cloned. They don't have the same um, diversity of genetics. It's usually static. Um, they don't, and then the other piece to it is they can cross pollinate with uh, an area. So if you're planting near a uh, park or conservation area, you can start getting those hybridized plants or, or uh, like what we're telling you about with the lupins, or you get plants that are um, uh, changing the dynamic of the, of the native populations that are out there. So it's, that's the part that it gets a little scary and it's hard to control. Yeah, definitely. What would you say to, to homeowners in the area who are just you know, going out to big block store nurseries and buying their favorite roses <laughs> and rudbeckias and all of these different plants? Yeah, so you uh, so buying some plants like purple coneflowers and black-eyed Susans, neither are really native to Long Island. Planting those, that's fine. Those are okay plants. Okay. Make sure you understand what plants are invasive. Um, there is uh, there is a group called the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area, liisma.org, and you can go on their website and you really they have a list of all the invasive species on Long Island that we know about, um, and that includes things like um, you know the uh, the uh, the different beetles and bugs and crabs and uh, swans, there's an invasive swan, you know, all the, that kind of stuff, but it also, and funguses and things like that, but it also a good to understand what is invasive for plants. And I, and I guarantee you that most people have plants in their yard that are invasive and they don't know that they're a problem. Um, and some of them are now on the do not, do not buy list. You can't, you can't sell them, you can't buy them. So for instance, uh, barberry and burning bush are two that just got put on, a, I don't know, about five, six years ago. And, um, and um, people have them in their yards and they haven't done it. So please don't plant those invasive species. Another right. one that's on there is like English ivy. Uh, it takes over and you find it ubiquitously across Long Island. So that's the first thing. 
then the next thing is um, if you're going to be planting, if you really want to plant for pollinators, if you really want to improve your vegetable garden, if you really want to have some really great color and design, really lean towards native plants. And what I recommend is that when you go to the nursery, ask for what you're looking for, that specific native plant. Don't, don't always get distracted by the, the, the cool colored plant that's blooming at the time when you go in the nursery. By the way, I'm just as guilty as everyone else about this, is going <laughs> into the nursery and, and get distracted about something interesting. And if you only go into the nursery in, in spring, your garden only blooms in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, so really think about diversifying and really looking for plants throughout for, for your garden for the whole year. And so when you're thinking about it, try to get as many natives as you can. And the one thing that you need to ask your nursery or garden center is, is this a true native plant or is this a cultivar? Um, so I, you really want to have the true native plant as much as you can. You want, and um, the cult, cultivars are not all bad, but there's a bunch that are not very good. And so what we wanna do is make sure that you get the right plant that's gonna provide the rec nectar source to bring in the bees or the hummingbirds um, and things, uh, butterflies, the things that most people wanna see uh, coming to their gardens. And, and then that also helps with your vegetables and other things. And right. you'll get more flowers and you get better, better fruit and, and uh, other uh, beneficial habitat out of the deal. So you're saying that it's more, it's, or it's less potentially damaging to buy plants that are non-native, that uh, won't <laughs> hybridize with the native yeah. plants than to buy yeah, so, cultivars. Yeah, so some plants. of the, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm catching myself up. It gets tricky, and this is the part that's hard. Right. So uh, lean towards native first. Mm -hmm. If you can't get native, get a cultivar of a native second. If you can't get either of those, or if you really love a plant that's not native, um, but, uh, and is not invasive, go ahead and plant that in your garden. If we can get somewhere around 70, 80% of your garden in native plants, you're doing a huge thing for the environment. Most homeowners on Long Island have only 5% or less native plants on their property. And most of those wow. are the trees. So crepe myrtle is not native. Hostas are not native. Daylilies are not native. Roses are not, 99% of the roses that people have in their yards are not native. So those, you know, it's not that those are bad plants. They're just that they're not doing much for, the, for your habitat or for the environment. Crepe myrtle might have a few um, bees coming to the flowers but it's the bigger picture is they're not providing habitat for the caterpillars and other beneficial insects that grew up with those plants because uh, crepe myrtles are from South Carolina and we don't have the right kind of insects that are associated with it. So there's zero, zero caterpillars on, on, on uh, crepe myrtles and there's 530 or whatever, 500 different species of caterpillars on an oak tree. That's totally different. If, and, and to really understand that, I would recommend that people get the books by Doug Talamay, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y, Doug okay. Talamay. He's a, he's, an, he's a professor from um, Maryland, I think. I'm fairly confident. It, uh, and, or, um, or Delaware, I, it, Central, Central East Coast. <laughs> and, uh, and he... Um, he has a couple great books out there um, uh, about bringing nature home uh, is the first book. And then he has a second one. And it's really about why we should be worried about native plants for your gardens and how is that going to help uh, the birds and the beneficial insects and your vegetable garden and so on and so forth. All right. I'll put the uh, link to his note or his books in the footnotes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We'll do. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. I feel like it's such an iconic kind of East Coast garden to the, the crepe myrtles and the hostas. And, and the boxwood yeah, and boxwood. the privet. None of that is native. That's yeah. so interesting. We need to like erase that from our minds and just Correct. start Correct. with the palette of native plants and work with that. 
Yeah, and and I'm um, I work for a company called Nelson Pope and Voorhees. It's an engineering and planning, environmental planning company, and um, I design uh, full time. And I have clients out on the east, especially on the far east end in the the Hampton area that have all their yards looking the same with the same nothing native plants in there. And uh, it's hard to get them to start thinking about it with more diversity and a, and a better palette of plants that are going to be better for habitat, for their yards, for stormwater, for air quality, and so on and so forth. Right. It's kind of like the war against lawns that's been. Yeah, right, on. right. Yeah, absolutely. And here's another good one to think about. Uh, there's a program in Minnesota called Lawns to Legumes. Mm -hmm. So the state of Minnesota is putting aside a very large chunk of money, multiple, multiple millions of dollars to uh, offset the cost to have homeowners transform their lawns to native plants and they help pay for it. And so it's called Lawns, lawn, lawns to Legumes. Lawns to Legumes. I'll definitely yeah. check that out and put a link as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since so you're, I have since a, you're putting... Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I just have one more question about what we were just talking about. Um, with invasive species, many people have them in their yards already. Yeah. Um, so you're saying definitely don't plant them, don't buy them. Should they be removed? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And there, and it, the more that you can remove those plants and replace them with better plants, uh, that and there's so many good native plants that people don't think about. We we talked about blueberries. Why not have a blueberry patch that you can eat from, or raspberries, or uh, there's a plant called chokeberry. It's aronia. Uh, there's two different aronias, a black one and a red one. All are very very edible, very tasty. Make great jams or jellies, or to put on your cereal or whatever you'd like with them. And, uh, or, um, you know, uh, the flowers, like all these plants behind my shoulder are, are native and, you know, aren't, I, I personally think it's absolutely stunning uh, with all that color. Okay. Um, so you can think about all of those things. And then there's great trees. Um, one of my favorite trees is the service berry. It has, my, my parents called it June berry because the red berries come out in June. It's the tastiest fruit you'll ever eat in your life. You just got to beat the birds to them. As soon as right. the birds start coming, you have to get out there and pick as much as you can. Again, makes a great jam or jelly um, and Beautiful things like that. Beautiful so, foliage too on the service berries. Absolutely. It's a four season that. plant. It has good structure, has white flowers, then mm -hmm. red berries, and then fall color. It's yeah. really a, a stunning plant that people don't uh, utilize as much as they should. Would be a great project to make a comparative like website or list. So you want to plant this, plant this. You can find that on the uh, Cornell Continuing Education. Okay. So you can, they have a brochure that you can download that says, if you want to create myrtle, maybe consider this. Better yet, here's the invasive plant. If you would, if you're concerned about burning bush, why not plant blueberries? Uh, has a stunning red color late in the fall, or 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 they'll have two or three options for you. All right, something else I'll link to. Yeah. <laughs> so since you're talking about links, I wanted to add. I'm gonna put a shout out. There's a, a some for Facebook people. There's a couple groups out there that. You can learn a lot about native plants that are very friendly to helping you. So there's one called uh, 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 Northport Native Garden Initiative, NNGI. And that's, it's based out of Northport, but you're on Facebook. You don't have to be from Northport to be on the, on the group. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one, Long Island Native Gardening Group. Uh, uh, that one is... Uh, run by um, one of my, uh, one of the other board members on Limpy, uh, Anthony, and uh, that they have, you can ask questions. I, you know, I'm pulling, a, you can post a picture. I'm taking out these plants beside the front door of my house for X reason. What are some natives that are going to do whatever you're looking for? You something that you can eat, something that brings in the butterflies, something that is just native. Uh, I need to do a screening 
uh, the, you know, the neighbor cut down some trees. I can see their house too much. What should be replaced on my side of the fence? Blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. So, and you'll, you'll slightly get inundated with, with suggestions, but it gives you a good spot to start researching to figure out what is really a good, you know, plant to, to choose from. Seems like a great um, resource. Right. And then to understand what is native and what is not native, the New York State has a flora atlas that you can uh, check out. So it's a New York State flora atlas, and it's a website. And in that website, you can uh, put in the name of a plant and it will tell you if it's native or not. Or you can click on a county and see the whole list of plants that are native in that county. All right, super. So that's kind of good. We'll definitely um, all those things. And I'm sure that there are similar resources for people in other areas as well, or there should be. Right, right, right. Yeah, outside of New York, um, there is similar uh, resources like that. So I was just on the Tennessee, Kentucky one uh, earlier today for another reason. And uh, they, they have a similar uh, website. And so it seems like most uh, places around the world, Missouri has one called Go, Go Native. Uh, so there's so many all over um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, all the states that they have something similar in just about everywhere. And this is also interesting that, you know, you're from Minnesota. Now you find yourself deeply immersed in the <laughs> local flora and fauna movement yeah. in New York. And I think it's important. We, we live in a time where people are all moving around so much yeah. with that yeah. sense of like being placed somewhere and at least respecting the ecology that you find yourself in. Like I, I'm a landscape designer and I worked with some clients in Santa Fe, New Mexico that stands out to me that people would always wanna bring these plants from the East Coast or the Midwest when they moved there to retire. Yeah, right, right. Like, you just can't, we just couldn't make them grow in the desert. It's like, <laughs> they have to be well, on their whole own irrigation system and. <laughs> well, so yeah, so I, how I design is about sustainable design work. So it's about not having to add water. Do not add fertilizer. Don't be cutting, you know, can we remove more lawn? And the, when I go meet a client, the first thing I usually ask is what part of their lawn do they only walk on to mow the grass? Mm -hmm. If it's never utilized for any other reason than to mow the grass, maybe it's time to consider changing it to something else. Get it else. out of there. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, that's that's one of the things that I I I, I think about when I first uh, 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 talk, you know, when I first meet somebody or talk to them as a client or a potential client. I love that. Yeah, let's give it back to nature. Um, and and just because I want to plug this, um, we have a uh, invasive and native plant symposium coming up on April seventh. So you can find that out through our website. It's not advertised yet. Uh, we are still finalizing planning, but it will be going up soon. Uh, but uh, I want to let people know that if you'd like to learn more about limpy or invasive species, we have a, an amazing lineup of speakers coming. We have Heather Holmes uh, from um, who wrote the books, uh, Pollinators, Bees, and Wasps, three different books, Pollinators, Another one about bees, another one about wasps. The wasp book just came out recently, and she's coming to talk about how to do small restorations in people's yards uh, and her new book about wasps. And then there's uh, we have uh, people from New York State, from just outside of uh, the uh, Long Island area. We have Long Island experts, um, and it's a, it's a as a bit of science, but really about how can we improve the environment with uh, re, uh, removing in, invasives and replanting with natives. Excellent. Yeah. And is that taking place in person and online or just? To it's gonna be only online. We are oh, okay. originally, we're gonna do a hybrid of having in-person for vaccinated people and uh, Zoom. But uh, when Omicron came along, we decided Let's just not even bother. Let's just go straight to Zoom and, and things. But we are doing some kind of cool things. We have, um, um, we're gonna have a poster session so people could come in and have discussions outside the group. We're looking at having little 
uh, side chat room. So the negative about not being in person is you don't get to network as well. So we're going to have opportunities for networking and places to talk to vendors and other things as well as hear the presentations. Um, and uh, we're working on the other thing that you miss in person is food, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at um, developing that the first bunch of people that sign up before two weeks prior to the symposium, a box of snacks shows up at their door. That's awesome. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we're looking at a whole bunch of fun things. We're trying to make it not the standard old Zoom, uh, you know, uh, piece. I, we really are trying to make, we're trying to shake it up and, and have some fun with it. That sounds really fun. And where can people sign up for that? It will be right on the website. So uh, okay. we'll have its own. Um, uh, so you can go either to the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area website or the LIMPI website. It will be up uh, probably in the next few weeks. We'll have that up. But you can just save the date April 7th. April 7th. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. So what advice would you have for people who are interested in starting something like LIMPI in their own areas? Okay. So the first thing you have to, I have to say is, um, please don't invent the wheel. Uh, <laughs> get an understanding of what you're doing. So reach out to organizations like ourselves. We are now helping other organizations in um, Massachusetts and uh, New England to do something similar to what we're doing. So um, we're, you know, reach out to organizations like ourselves. Understand what your goal is. What is your you know, is it about uh, your goal about propagating uh, local native plants or is your goal to protect the genetics or combination or is your goal having plants for sale? Understand what your goal is and then develop it from there. Um, and then, um, you know, is it, uh, you know, protecting plant populations or species based on risk? You know, think about what plants you're worried about and develop that goals with uh, holistic um, uh, seed, pro you know, uh, seed productions or propagations. Um, you're gonna need, eventually you're gonna need a staff person. We have a, a, um, uh, a nursery manager, part-time nursery manager, and that helps. And then understanding the space that it takes. It, it's uh, when you're doing things that we are doing. So for instance, we are at uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph in Brentwood. We took over their four court tennis court and have a greenhouse, two hope houses that are 90 feet long, uh, and, um, and then a big open area to grow all of our plants. And so we have a large space and, and you need that. Plus we have a founder's yard that's an acre in size. So space is an issue. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, kind of understand what you need uh, and, and that this is gonna take time. I told you at the beginning, we started in 2005 and where our humble beginnings of where we're started and where we are now is, is we've grown by leaps and bounds, but it's taken you know, um, 15 years to get to where we're at. And so it, it's just, it's time and it's, it's slow incremental changes. And I, I wanna tell you, I wish we had a more robust or more broad, um, listing of plants that we are uh, that we have for availability we're we're struggling to uh continue where you know we would love to con have 20 30 new species every year mm -hmm. but we're only adding you know two to five every year so we're getting wider and wider in our diversity of plants that we're offering but it's not nearly as big as or as fast as i would like to do it so, right you know so don't invent wheels think about it really hard you know, and, and then what are, what's your goals, I think are the big things. Probably finding a network of people I can imagine is super necessary as well. Mm -hmm. And there, and we're all, at, we have yet to meet anyone that's not going to help you. So if you're interested in doing something like this, you know, here's, if you live here on Long Island, become a board member, join us for a little while and, and really get to know the ins and outs. And we'll gladly share if that's something that you want to do. And then take it somewhere else. Right. At the beginning um, of our discussion, you were talking about all of the different businesses that have come together to help Limpy, especially in the beginning years. And yeah, yeah. Were the, was that just 
you know, connections made by reaching out to people? Yes, and really showing how big of a need there was that we were all struggling trying to find the correct plants for our projects. And so, um, yes, that was, it was um, reaching out to all the different groups and organizations and, and networking with everyone to kind of figure out what is going to work and what and how to, how to do it and how to think mm -hmm. about it. I, one more thing I wanted to touch on. Um, there's a big push in certain environmental areas. Like when I was, I went to Kenya and saw um, some mine restoration sites a few years ago. Yep. And uh, they were using a lot of invasive species that could withstand these like incredibly degraded conditions as sort of pioneers before reintroducing the native plants. And that was justified just because they couldn't, they were having trouble finding plants that could, you know, withstand these terrible conditions. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, so um, um, they probably didn't have much opportunity here. So Kenya is a little different than here, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. um, here, we can find those pioneer species that would be uh, great to use on a uh, on a site. So, for instance, um, one of my projects is in uh, New York City at a very degraded site that is on uh, a brown field and uh, and is is really in bad shape. And we are using pioneer species to uh, to uh, get it started, but they're going to be native. They're native pioneer species can because we, we can find them. So here in the States, you're going to be easy, have an easier time finding the original plants that would have been in that area that would transform. So just like the black-eyed Susans behind me aren't on that site anymore uh, that you can see, the seed is still there, uh, the plants are still there, um, and uh, they were the pioneer, pioneer species for this meadow. Okay, so uh, they, and so here in the States, it would be easier. So I would avoid invasives at the beginning, non-native plants that are not invasive, that's different. But an invasive species that's gonna to try to take over the world, um, that's where I would probably draw the line unless you don't have a choice. And then if you're going to do that, then you have to, and, and I hope you're doing it for a reason, like you're pulling a certain chemical out of the ground or you're trying to uh, fix the soil, get it a thicker uh, soil matrix that will support other life or getting soil moisture, soil moisture or something else into that soil. I hope you're doing it for a specific reason with mm -hmm. a goal. And when you reach that goal that you have an eradication method to eliminate it from the site completely and then replant it in the way that it probably should be planted in the beginning. So I would, I, I'd say it's not the wrong idea it's just that I think there's, it makes it harder and you have to think about it more specifically and how to protect that site. Mm -hmm. So have a thorough and, exit strategy. Right. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of invasive species here in, the, here in the United States that we've done that same thought process. So there's a bunch of plants that were developed to um, put along the roadsides to stop erosion because it would grow really, really fast and stop the erosion from digging out a road and putting up down a new road. The problem is that those invasive plants didn't stay in the roadside. They're now in farm fields or uh, open spaces next to it and now pretty much are across, uh, across the United States. So for instance, autumn olive is a, is a shrub. Um, uh, reed canary grass uh, was, is a grass that was developed, um, and and in the list is probably the length of my arm that of plants that we thought were going to be a, doing a good thing, and um, if now uh, are displacing our native uh, populations and are more of a bad thing. Right. And some of those so, are edibles, like the autumn olive. I've heard. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. So it was. Protecting erosion, providing food for grouse and animals. You know, we thought it was going to be a really good thing, but what it's done is it's it the the food is not as nutritious as the native plant for that for the animals that are here that have developed over a millennia to uh, to that uh, to its climate and, and mm -hmm. uh, for its species. 
think a lot of native yeah. plants too, like pawpaws. We just are such a weird beings, people. We don't eat the things that grow naturally around us. Right. We're chipping in bananas and pineapples instead of eating pawpaws. Or persimmons. Right. Yeah. Why why are we not eating persimmons? Um, or right, all those things. Yes, right. Or hazelnuts, you know, or or yeah, there's just so many things that acorns. we do not use. Right. Or even just acorns, right? Right. Exactly. Why are we not utilizing the plants that are naturally found here? Um, that were, by the way, were being utilized by the people before us. Right. <laughs> we displaced we... them and their food. Yeah. So. We have to get back to that and be open to changing our tastes and our styles and well and some of them taste really really good we just forgot yeah or to have never tried them or have never tried them like the juneberry that i was telling you about the service berry most people have never eaten it and it's one of the best things i've ever had um i have a, a cupboard full of uh um black chokeberry jam in my cupboard that I use on my toast every day. So it's it's one of my favorite fruits. But again, very few people know that it's a great plant. Well, that's very inspiring. I hope that people <laughs> listening to this will immediately go and look up native- Aronia melanocarpa. <laughs> yeah, it's time for us to come home to the areas that we're in. Yeah, right. Well, that's pretty cool that you got to spend time in, in, uh, um, oh, through that the name has slipped my mind now. Kenya. Kenya. Did you have a chance to, uh, uh, did they, did you get to see why they planted the plants that they chose? Yeah. So we went all around the mine and basically it was an active mine. So half of it was still being mined. And then as they moved, it was like a government funded restoration too, which I thought was really excellent. Um, they would start with these, I forget the name of the tree, but um, really giant trees that would hyper accumulate salt. Ah, got it. I understand yeah. why. And so then they were cutting it down and harvesting those trees to get the salt out of the soil. Right, exactly. And then yeah. they were transforming it back into this like super tropical lush wetland environment which is oh that's wonderful so then yeah. they are doing it for the right reasons and doing it the correct way but that's not normal um right so I, and i've done some plan i've done some plans out west that had um that tnt uh the explosive was in the soils from um from an old department of defense uh installation and so we planted to pull the TNT out of the soils to, and then, uh, and then harvest those uh, those plants to to remediate the soil to a, a soil that was going to be more conducive to what it should be. So it it's done. But but we were using um, uh, popular poplar trees, which were native to the area, to do that work. Right. I think you're right on when you say we have more. Like we have so much more of a communication network in the U.S than yes. is available currently in parts of Africa, I know. Right, so right. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Some I took a permaculture design course there and uh, we were talking about different way, methods for vermicomposting. And I said, well, you know, you could use a bathtub. I've done that before. And then you just put a little container to collect the worm liquid underneath the drain of the bathtub. And my classmates who are from Africa were like, we don't just have like unused Bath tubs. bathtubs just laying around. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we developed, uh, you might want to look this one up. There's a, a, a type of gardening practice called a keyhole garden. Mm -hmm. um, do you know about it? Yeah, I do. Oh, it but was developed for Ethiopia. It was, huh? was it? Okay. So it was developed for Ethiopia back in the 80s when it was in um, a famine. So what a keyhole garden is, uh, what I like to do is a circle, but you can, the shape doesn't matter. But uh, we did a 10 foot diameter circle and in the center is a two foot diameter compost bin. So you create the compost bin, then you, uh, I, I, we used rock to go around the outside edge. And then in the one piece, there's like a little a bump, bump that goes in so that you, you uh, it's a 10 foot diameter circle but then there's a, a pathway, a break in that uh, uh, outside ring that goes to the, the compost bin in the center. It is um, 18 inches tall about of rock. 
Uh, then we fill it up with soil. Uh, the compost uh, goes into the compost bin in the middle. The compost breaks down and feeds the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just continually put compost in. Then if you use uh, square foot gardening techniques of planting or the three sisters idea from uh, Native American tech times of planting uh, the plants together very tightly in this 10 foot diameter circle, it was enough food to really keep a family alive very uh, in, in Ethiopia. It takes very little water because it's only, uh, you know, 10 square, uh, uh, it's only 10 foot diameter area. Uh, the compost feeds itself. Um, rock is readily available. And then what we did is in the, in the outside ring between the rocks, we would plant plants like herbs and things as well. So you'd have your, your plants like er, you know, herbs or other smelly plants around the outside edge that have a distinct odor. It usually helps keep the rabbits from getting in there. And then uh, your vegetables inside. And uh, it doesn't take much water. It feeds itself and it works really well. I have one in my own garden. Um, that's how I grow my, my wife teases, teases me and calls it a prayer circle, <laughs> but uh, it's a way to um, uh, keep, do a really good gardening technique. And it's been done for a long time, but nobody seems to know what they are. Not very many people, obviously, Bethany, right. that not many people know what a keyhole garden is here in the States. But the reason why it's called a keyhole is that, that inside it looks like a keyhole. Right. Yeah, there's so many different clever ways of planting companion plants and in small areas that are just yeah. so abundant. Yeah. Yeah, I I went a little overboard in my vegetable garden. I had squash coming out of my ears this year. <laughs> Spaghetti squash and butternut mm -hmm. squash and <laughs> winter squash. And then I, I had tomatoes squash. coming out of my ears today too. And I good thing I like both of them, but uh yes, I had too much this year. I planted a little too heavy with those. And not quite heavy enough with some of the other things that we liked as much. So, yeah, I hope you have a cellar or something. Yeah, Someone yeah, we've, we've, we've done some freezing. We've done some things. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'd love to see your work um, as a landscape designer. Do you have a website I can link as well so people can go and see what you're working on? Yeah, so you can go to our website, Nelson Pope Voorhees. Um, and um, let's see here. I'm going to try to. Make sure I have, oops. Um, it's Nelson, uh, H, you know, www.nelsonpope.com. Okay. And, okay. and with that, and, and, and N-E-L-S-O-N and Pope is like uh, uh, P-O-P-E, just like the very famous guy over in Rome. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And then um, there, there's a, there's a subgroup, Nelson Boat Voorhees, and you can see a bunch of pictures and things that we do and how we do things, but uh, absolutely you can reach out that way. And that also means that if anyone else is on the podcast who would like to reach out to me, that's a good way of catching up to me as well. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just ask you a couple of closing questions, and I've been adjusting my closing questions since I started this podcast because of you know reactions from different guests. And so now I'm only doing a couple. Um, so I'm curious to know what your um, opinion is on the most impactful thing we can individually do to uh, benefit our communities locally and our larger global family. Um, well, so honestly, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna stick to natives just because that's what we've been talking about today. Um, I think that the biggest change that we could really do is if 20% uh, of homeowners across the United States uh, put in native gardens in their yards, we could actually create a habitat that is larger than Yellowstone National Park. Um, it would be 10, 20 times larger than Yellowstone National Park. It is one of the, you know, lawn grass is really, what do we get out of lawn grass? We can't eat it. Um, most, most critters can't eat it. The only animals that really eat it are, are geese, Canada geese, and we don't want them in our yard. Um, and not even rabbits really eat it. So only when they're mm -hmm. desperate. So it, it really doesn't do much. And, uh, and so what I would really love to see is more and more people planting native plants. If you can only choose one plant, choose a, an oak tree if you can. It has, it is the biggest bang for your buck from a habitat standard 
It has acorns that a lot of critters eat. Um, it has uh, the, a whole bunch of uh, 500 plus uh, butterflies and moths uh, have caterpillars that uh, need an oak tree to as part of their life cycle. Um, so really, if we could do that, that would be a, a huge uh, benefit to the to ecosystems and biodiversity. And then the next piece to it that I think is important is uh, look to find out what a rain garden is. Um, one of the things that we have done on across the United States is water was has been public enemy number one, and we get it away from our property as quick as possible, run it down the street and down a drain and out to the lake or stream or here, bay or harbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever it picks up on its way is also going to that bay, harbor, lake, stream. And so um, we have polluted our waters pretty significantly um, out, in the, out in the environment. So it, one of the things that you can do is a rain garden is a shallow bowl we put into the landscape on purpose. We put the water towards it from the house or driveway. That water is then cleaned and cooled um, through uh, chemical and natural processes going through this uh, groundwater. And that water is then gets into our groundwater in a much healthier condition, still goes out to our lakes, bays, streams, but is clean, cool, and doing a better job for the environment. So that's the other one that I would add. All right, excellent. I love the vision of going through like a suburban neighborhood and just seeing native wildflower gardens and vegetables and right, rain right. gardens everywhere. Well, so if you're thinking about this, uh, there is a study that we helped do in 2002 through 2006 in Burnsville, Minnesota. So again, you can put this on your website. Mm -hmm. uh, if you Google Burnsville rain garden study, um, you will, uh, and Burnsville is B-U-R-N-S-V-I-L-L-E. And uh, they have, uh, you can see what they have done. Uh, the road is called Rushmore Avenue. There are 17 rain gardens along the roadway out of 24 homes. So most of the homes have rain gardens along it. Wow. Uh, it looks absolutely stunning as you drive through the neighborhood, but all of 93% uh, of the rain that falls on that neighborhood never makes it to the catch basin. 93% of the rain wow. stays on the properties, gets clean, cooled, and still goes out to Crystal Lake, which is a few blocks away, but has a heck of a lot cleaner. It takes two months to get there through the groundwater instead of 20 seconds down the pipe. Right. That's amazing. Very hopeful. Mm -hmm. What is your, you've given us so many things to uh, look at during this interview, but do you have any additional required readings or podcasts or uh, blogs for our listeners? Well, yeah, I guess I've already done most of them. I was thinking about it as I was going. <laughs> um, yeah, so back to Doug Talmay, I would really, if you can hear him speak, he's an amazing speaker. You usually can find something on the web about one of his talks. Um, and then um, you can, and, and of course his books, um, we talked about Heather Holmes, our symposium. Um, the Native Plant Trust is a good website to consider. They have, uh, they really talk about how to do native plants in, in your gardens and, and how to do that and, and where to go. And I'm going to tell you that there's, uh, here on Long Island, there's a number of people like me that design for sustainability, uh, design for native plantings, and and so if you're going to redo your yard for some reason, whatever it may be, you're putting in a new pool or uh, you need to dress, you know, you just need to refurbish it a little bit. Consider, really consider getting uh, a designer. Don't get the, the normal folks down the road, you know, that are going to give you a look that looks exactly like the neighbors are across the street really look to get somebody that's going to help you understand what to choose and why to choose it and have something a little more unique for your garden and and, and is going to provide a habitat and, and benefits beyond you. Right. Or just require that your landscape designer design using natives. Right, right. Or uh, I, I guess another one is the long is the maintenance. You know, instead of the maintenance contractor that's coming and mowing the grass and blowing the leaves, stop blowing the leaves out of the gardens. Leave the leaves in the gardens. Take it off the lawn. That's fine. I, I don't have any problems with that. 
um, but make sure that the gardens are kept with leaves because they are holding um, warmth and things for our beneficial insects in our gardens. Mm -hmm. And stop cutting down your garden all the way to the ground in the fall. Leave it up in the fall throughout the winter. It brings a little winter interest. Some of the uh, some of the birds will be eating the seeds off the seed off the off the flower heads in the middle of winter. And wait until it's consistently 50 degrees outside. And if you're going to cut it back, uh, personally, I don't cut mine back. I, I wait until way into the summer. But if you're going to cut it back, cut it off at different lengths between 8 and 12 inches so that uh, the beneficial insects that are hiding in the stem for the winter have a chance to emerge and help your garden. So there's a whole bunch of like bees, sweat bees are really, really small. They're the size of the end of your pinky. And they're hiding out for the winter in the stem of your of your hollow stemmed perennials. And if you cut it back and throw them away, you've thrown away your bees. So keep them there. Um, and and for instance, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. And of course, these bees are so small; they're not stinging you. They're not harming you. They're pollinating your plants. Awesome! I love that. I didn't realize. I had never heard that about the different heights. Yeah, yeah, keep it as, as long as you can. So for instance, um, you know, the, a lot of, of, of our perennial plants have hollow stems, uh, uh, goldenrods. Most mm -hmm. people know what a goldenrod is. It doesn't cause allergies and it has this beautiful yellow flower, really important in the late fall, October and November for our monarchs to get enough energy to fly south to Mexico. If you don't have them out there, they don't have enough energy and it's part of the monarch decline. Um, but their stems are hollow, and uh, if you have ever seen them in the wild, you occasionally see a gull, uh, a, a, a bulb on the stem about yeah. halfway up, and that has, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, beetles that do that, or flies, but also in that hollow stem, probably in a different area, are things like uh, the sweat bees or other um, insects that are hiding out through the winter. Um, there's so many cavity nesting bees that hide in those uh, in those stems, and so when you cut them back, you you don't have them in your yard, and you're probably killing the plant or killing the bee as well. So and doing yourself them. a disservice. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Plus the winter garden. I mean. No, I think they're stunning. I, I yeah, think that, especially with like this last snow that we got. Just think of it being mounded and crystallized on the plants, and it's just it's really cool. It's really yeah. Cool. Absolutely. So where's the best place to reach you? Um, uh, so you can catch me at my office uh, work, uh, or you can go to my, um, uh, which I have already gave, uh, provided you. But the other one that works is my um, Limpy email. And so you can either go to info at limpy.com, or you can go to, I, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it is, one second. It's uh, rusty at limpy.org. So it can either go info at limpy.org or rusty at limpy.org. All right. Well, thank you so, so much. Is there anything else you want to add before we end our conversation? Uh, go, go native. <laughs> Just native. <laughs> uh, give it an opportunity to, to give it a go and, and think about what are some opportunities and uh, get some help if you want it. There's plenty of people out there that can help. All right. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for no, taking this time. No problem. Thank you very much. All right. Have a great day. Yes, you too. <laughs> Bye.